Hello there, it's Tom and Magnolia here, and this is Gunna Creek Court Chapter 54, Meetings and Re-Meetings. Hello. This chapter begins with a sort of storybook sequence, and I did it like this because originally the beginning part of this chapter was going to be drawn pretty much the same as any other chapter, with Coyote arranging a meeting and then having a conference with the people in the court, but I felt that that would have been far too similar to not only the sequence in chapter 14, but also wouldn't have been very visually interesting. So sometimes when I'm stuck in a situation like that, I will try and come at the sequence completely differently, and I think in this case it worked out pretty well. I really like how you've drawn all the characters here. Is there anything in the sequence that you had a hard time figuring out how to draw in this style? Not particularly, and I think that's because when I came to draw this sequence, I pretty much allowed myself to throw any rules out of the window, and for me that's pretty fortunate because that makes drawing a sequence like this a whole lot easier, and I think I was helped by the fact that I designed Coyote in such a way that he can really be drawn in any manner, and as long as I keep a few of his design elements, like his colors and his teeth, then it's pretty obvious that I'm drawing Coyote. And when I was drawing the sequence, I just took the opportunity to really free myself up and draw each of the characters in just whatever way I thought looked kind of cool at the time. And I think in this case it kind of worked out. So while I designed each of the individual characters like Annie and Tony in a specific way, when it came to Coyote I just drew whatever really. And because of his character I think it really worked. I think Tony's design is especially good here and I've noticed that the way that you've drawn his face here it's become kind of an iconic representation of him elsewhere in the comic as well. Yeah I think the design of his face was simple enough and kind of gets across what I was trying to put forward with Tony. And the fact that he's called the broken man in Coyote's little story here is about as much information as you need for Tony at this point. And it sort of mimics the line that Annie has down her face, but because Tony is the broken guy with a broken nose and everything, that line is just twisted and jagged now. And I think it was a pretty concise way of getting across what I wanted with that character. I remember when this page first went up, I found that last panel very chilling, probably more so because it's in this storybook style. Yeah, and I think this sequence here really goes towards why doing the entire scene in this style worked out for the best, because I could have drawn a large sequence of Coyote growing giant and then pushing over one of the buildings and spending a lot of time figuring out how that scene would go, but here I think not only is that action put across very concisely, I think leaving a lot of the visuals up to the reader's imagination really helped it here, and the way the coyote is drawn and the kind of implication as to what's happening here I think is a lot more effective done in this style. And then a little bit later we'll see the consequences of his action drawn in the more regular style, and I think the decision to do it this way worked out for the better. And I know that Tony's decision not to let Annie come into the forest seems unreasonable to us, but Really, when you think about it, it is kind of crazy that they just let her go hang out with this very dangerous creature, and I think he kind of has a point here. Yeah, in the context of what Tony is aware of, he's not really privy to any of the development that Annie has gone through in the story at this point, so it kind of makes sense. Since the forest has always been a dangerous area that is sort of off limits anyway, I don't think it's an unreasonable request for Tony to say that she's not allowed in the forest, considering he doesn't know really about anything that she's gotten up to in there. And really, I think it's kind of a reasonable question that Tony puts to towards Coyote. And I also feel that it's a reasonable response that Coyote gives back, pointing out that up till now Annie's been safe in the forest, and she's had a good time and it's allowed her to grow and develop as a person, but in no uncertain terms Coyote is pointing out that since Tony has been back, all Annie has done is revert into herself and close herself off from everything around her. So on the previous page when Coyote said that that he could eat up Tony and no one would be sad except for Annie, I guess it kind of sums it all up, doesn't it? Yeah, it's mirroring the whole sequence of events that has been happening since Tony arrived back in the court, not only with the other people that know Tony, but the readers too. And Coyote understands that really nobody cares about Tony except for Annie. And that really is the point that he's putting across here. It seems like out of everybody, Annie is the only one who would really stick up for her dad, even at this point and Coyote is insightful enough not only to understand that but also to use that knowledge to get what he wants. In this case, getting Tony to allow Annie to come back into the forest. And I didn't really want this to seem like a huge struggle that I would have to spend a lot of time on in the story where Annie or other people are trying to convince Tony to allow her to go back to the forest. I felt that it was a small enough conflict that it could be resolved in a sequence like this. And that goes back to what I was saying earlier about deciding to draw this scene 
in this style. If it had just been a regular scene of them standing around and talking and then ultimately deciding to allow Annie back into the forest, I think the whole beginning part of this chapter would have been a lot less interesting. And with that, we come to the second part of the chapter, tied in with this initial shot of the consequences of Coyote having knocked over one of the buildings. For some reason, I remember there not being casualties to this, but I don't think it's confirmed anywhere in the comic that there were no casualties when this happened. It's, it isn't mentioned anywhere in the comic, but yeah, it's safe to say that there probably were no casualties here. It's been established at this point that there's a lot of empty buildings in the court, and I think Coyote would have understood instinctively that if he was going to knock over a building, he should do it in such a way that nobody's actually going to get hurt, because that probably would have kicked things off for the court. I guess we can see with context clues that if there were casualties, we would have seen the evidence of that in the page, rather than just the building being knocked over. Sure, and, and I think it would have been kind of irresponsible of me to have implied that people would have got hurt in this and then just go straight back to Annie being allowed back into the forest because if Annie being allowed into the forest resulted in somebody getting hurt, I think that kind of would have changed the context of the whole scene and the, the whole situation, really. Yeah. But with that sequence over, Annie is starting to get a hold of herself and that's really what the rest of this chapter is about. Not only that, but also seeing that the rabbit has a new body now and the three of them are going to head off into the woods to meet up with the fairy friend from a few chapters ago. This is the first time we've seen the rabbit's new body. Is there anything you want to say about how you designed uh, this character? Only in the sense that I used some of the features that a rabbit might have when I drew this guy, like using some of the same colors for his hair and sort of leaving a kind of rabbit nose on him. Other than that, I just wanted him to seem like a fairly regular, sort of chubbyish boy, but that's about it, really. And all three of them head off into the forest. And this is the first time that Isengrin has seen Annie with her hair cut. This page made me wonder how much sense of touch Isengrin actually has in those wood fingers, since it's not really part of his body. No, he doesn't really have any sort of sensation of touch. But but since he's had this wooden body for so long, he has learned to gauge how much pressure to apply and how to use the body without damaging whatever it is he's touching. And here he's touching her hair not to get any sensation out of it, but more to draw the fact that he's noticed, really, what Annie has done to herself, as he says outright in the next page. And I wanted this scene to tie into what I'd brought up in an earlier chapter with Annie, acting on the advice that Isengrin had given her, and here showing that Annie is sort of misinterpreted a little bit. So here Isengrin isn't really responding to Annie the way that she seems to want. Yeah, and I wanted to get across the indication that the stuff that is really bothering Annie here is really of no consequence to a Sengren. Well, but also she's not really getting at what the actual problem is, and it seems like in the later pages he does sort of understand that in a way. A little bit, and here the stuff that Annie brings up kind of ties into how Annie was a little bit manipulative towards Kat a few chapters ago, in that she's kind of trying to outwardly feel sorry for herself, and it's just not flying with the Sengren whatsoever. It's kind of like the specific details of what is bothering Annie are not really what's important, just how the situation is affecting Annie in general. And it goes to show that, that the way that Annie's talking about this, it shows that she's not really in touch with her feelings about it. And that is kind of exactly why Isengrin does destroy her blinker stone here, because he sees that she has taken his advice to, I guess, compartmentalize her anger in a very literal sense and in a very unhealthy way, when really his advice would be more that you should learn to deal with anger or anything that is making you angry by facing it first and then squaring it away, which is kind of what he does force her to do here, in a way that is a little clumsy, but I think is very much in Isengrin's character. And I noticed that in the last panel, Isengr does reveal that he uh, does understand what's bothering Annie, and it's not so much about the makeup or the cheating, but the idea that her father is not really recognizing his daughter or getting to know her as she is now. Yeah, and Isengrin is pretty perceptive for just a big brute, I guess, which is the, the image that he puts out to everyone, but Annie and I guess the readers at this point know that Isengrin is more than that. And I guess really, Isengrin is kind of a softie at heart, but I wanted to get across here that the respect and consideration that Annie's earned from Isengrin at this point is not something that should be taken lightly. So while Annie might have been able to gain a bit of sympathy from Kat, that's not really something that she can do with Isengrin in the same way. And so the respect and the consideration that she's earned from Isengrin has not been lightly given. It's also not lightly played upon. I remember there was some criticism about the idea that Isengrin kind of forced Annie to do this, but I imagine that you didn't do that without considering what it meant. Sure, and Isengrin is not a perfect person. He's not somebody who has a lot of experience empathizing with people, and so I'm sure there is plenty to criticize about Isengrin's approach here. But did you feel that Annie needed a push, basically? No, she definitely did, and her personality is such that sometimes she will need a bit of a stern hand, and at this point her wallowing in her self-pity is not doing anybody any favors. 
not least the rabbit boy that she had promised to help. And so here, really, Nisenguin's role is to snap her out of it. And in a very physical sense, not only is Annie having to deal with the feelings that she's separated out with a blinker stone, but she's also had to push them down and control the fire that's within her right at the moment where that fire could have ended up hurting someone. But it did hurt Isengrin a little. Yeah, and Isengrin purposefully put himself in that position where Annie has physically done him damage because he needs to illustrate just how dangerous these sort of unchecked feelings can be. And this is him being insightful in his own way. So what's the significance of... Smitty's glance at Isengrin then? I think it's just a little approval because um, Smitty knows that what Isengrin has done is helped Annie. And while Andrew doesn't know Isengrin as much as Annie does, he at least knows that he doesn't have to outright come out and congratulate Isengrin for a job well done. Just an acknowledgement is enough. And with that business out of the way, we get to the part of the chapter where the rabbit finally meets the fairy again and it's revealed that the fairy's name is Snuffle. At least in English it is. These pages are very sweet. Yeah, and it's just um, tying up what was brought up in chapter 48. And I also wanted to give a little hint as to why the fairies and the creatures from the forest are important to the court, by how Snuffle is able to take one look at the Rubik's Cube and then instantly figure out the amount of permutations that it takes to solve it without even fully understanding what the object is. I think this is also kind of a nice punchline to what happened in chapter 48, where where Snuffle seemed to have like a more simplistic understanding of math, where she described centuries as being lots of ten. But here you can see that even though she describes it that way, she does, she does seem to have like a very intelligent understanding of math and things like that. Yeah, and the fairies and the animals don't know what math is, but they seem to grasp numbers in a more conceptual way. And so here we do get some criticism of the approach that Singren has taken. Annie is not particularly happy that her blinker stone was destroyed, but she does understand the importance of what a Singren has said to her. Was it kind of sad for you to get rid of the blinker stone, considering that it was such an important, you know, part of the comic from the, um, not quite from the beginning, but from early on? Not sad exactly, because I'd always intended for her to lose the blinker stone. I guess Anya had described it early as like training wheels, and she can't have training wheels forever. Yeah, that's pretty much exactly it. And at this point, I wanted Annie to sort of move away from using the blinker stone stone as a crutch, which is almost exactly why Sanger destroyed it. Because after the setback with her dad, it's time for Annie to do a bit of growing again. And Annie resolves to get Renard back. And until then, this bonus page was just expanding on the idea of me being able to draw coyote in any particular way that I want. As long as I just have a few colors and a few sharp coyote teeth, I can really get away with a lot when I'm drawing him. And so this was just an opportunity for me to put together some of the unused drawings of coyote in this chapter. I like the one where he has a really long mouth. And that is that. So come back again for chapter 55, The Breakout. See ya!